So I'd love to introduce the stage, Tim Rose and Paul Blake. Give them a big round of applause. Hello. <laughs> Stop it. <laughs> Morning, morning. Sorry it's so early. Good morning. Do you want to come a little closer? No, you're all happy where you are. Okay. No, you're fine. I'll, I'll be distributing sweets, chocolates, and breakfast in Only five to the minutes. front row, though. Yeah. Do you want to, can you want to come and stand behind? Yeah. So uh, give it up for our Star Wars cosplayers. Big round of applause. Morning, morning, morning. Wow, don't look amazing. One more morning. time, our Star Wars morning. cosplayers. Morning. Big round of applause. Morning, Ula. Wow, <laughs> they look fantastic. These guys spend over 12 months or two years planning their outfits. They look fantastic. All this heavy latex that they wear are just yeah. absolutely amazing. So thank you so much guys for being part of our Star Wars panel. We really appreciate it. So Tim, Paul, an absolute... Oh, okay. <laughs> Fantastic. Thank you so much. Oh, there's trouble at Mill. <laughs> um, so, Tim and Paul, thank you so much for being part of our Star Wars Q&A today. So, obviously, you were part of one of the most iconic films in history, and no doubt, no matter what they make in the future, Star Wars will always be an iconic set of films. What was it like appearing in Star Wars? And, and tell us, what was it like when you first got that call, obviously, to be Admiral Akbar and Greedo? Like, what was it like to receive a call like that? Well, for me, I was just the right age that when the very first movie came out, I was still a teenager, me and my buddies sitting in the cinema, feet up on the seats, flying our X-wings and everything. And then by the time we were doing the third movie, I was saying good morning to Carrie Fisher and Harrison Ford and walking past the Millennium Falcon to get into my own spaceship. So I can tell you, as a young man, <laughs> you know, you had to pinch yourself, and they're paying me to do this as well. <laughs> so I had um, an absolutely idyllic time. My camera never stopped taking pictures, which of course I wasn't allowed to keep any of afterwards, but <laughs> mm -hmm. it, was, it was great. It was a combination of fantasy dream come true and work at the same time. Wow. And what about you, Paul? What was it like, well, obviously, when you got a, a phone call to say you are going to be in a Star Wars film? You probably didn't have any concept about how big it was going to be. <laughs> Thanks, Tim. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, like, like Tim, for me, it was slightly different because being in the first one, uh, no one knew. No one knew anything <coughs> about what was going on or what was uh, going to happen. And it was all very spontaneous, shall yeah. we say, because so many things had to be done so quickly without any previous reference. Yeah. So all the actors that I was involved in, apart from uh, obviously Harrison and uh, Carrie and, uh, and Mark, thought we were in the attack of the killer tomatoes. We had no idea that the movie was going to be as successful and as big as the franchise has become over the last 40 years. So for me, it was kind of just like another job, really, until the morning I walked out onto uh, the Elstree soundstage. And this the Millennium Falcon was a mock-up at one end. It wasn't real. It was just a painted backdrop with a, um, a, a sort of gangway up the middle where you walked up and then fell off the end. That's how sophisticated it was. But it was pretty beautifully painted, so we thought, ah, oh, this could be quite exciting. And uh, I have a few memories of playing in the gun turrets of the Millennium Falcon with the green screen behind us and uh, pretending to shoot Harrison Ford quite a lot. It's the only chance I did get to shoot him. So Paul, obviously you touched on Harrison Ford there, and obviously he was very young when he did the first film. What was it like, what was he like as a young guy, obviously being in the first Star Wars movie? What was it like to work with him? He was an absolute bastard. Uh, no, no, oh, no. 
<laughs> Stop rolling. <laughs> Hi, Harrison. Just uh, only kidding there, Harrison. No, he was a very young actor. Uh, hadn't um, done that much work before Star Wars. He'd been on American Graffiti, which is where George Lucas saw him and uh, decided to use him for Star Wars. And uh, he was very aware of the weight of the, the movie yeah. resting on his shoulders. So he was very professional about what he was doing. Very witty, quite fun, yeah. uh, but he knew what was happening. And uh, so he took it pretty seriously. So I suppose Star Wars kind of made his career, didn't it really? Because obviously it's a, an iconic classic film. I mean, look at all these guys, all the hard work they've put into their outfits 40 years on. There's not many films I can mention that will stand the test of time like that. Um, tell us about George Lucas. Uh, what was he like as a person? Because obviously he's, got, he's one of those people that have got an extremely creative mind. He can see into the future. Did you obviously, do you get to meet George Lucas and work closely with him? No, never. Did. Never get to? <laughs> oh, great. This is going to be a great year. No. Nope. George had come from editing. And people who choose editing for a living tend to be rather quiet and insular. You know, it's usually you and two or three other people in a dark room cutting bits of film all day long or something. And George was very much that way. He was very quiet. Okay. I don't think, have you ever heard him shout? I've never heard George shout. I have a, a story that I tell, um, I did a film Return to Oz, which was directed by Walter Murch, who did a lot of the editing with George. And he invited everybody over to his house to do a barn raising. And we built this barn, but then we had wood left over. So we decided that we were going to build a chicken coop for the chickens. But George thought that it would be really nice if we cut a heart-shaped door in the front of the chicken coop. Ah. And, well, yeah, you say that. No. But we let him cut the door in the front and then he was, had to go home. And then we ran and got the bits of wood and put them back in because you can't have a door in the front of a chicken coop or the weasels come in and eat all your chickens. Ah, oh, wow. But nobody would tell George that he couldn't have a heart in the door if he wanted one. <laughs> so there was that side of things. <laughs> He, he didn't have to shout because everybody did whatever he asked them to do. <laughs> if George Lucas wants a heart in his chicken coop, he can have one. That's all good. He can have one. Um, so tell us, obviously, you guys obviously played kind of, uh, you had, you know, headgear on and, and things like that, and you had to go into makeup. And obviously, you know, working on a big film like that, you probably have to be in costume for quite a long period of time. I mean, obviously, I mean, how did you cope with that? Because obviously it gets quite hot, doesn't it? Obviously, mm -hmm. as, as Admiral Akbar. Um, so, you know, just tell us what it was like in Guido. What was it like being in the mask for that long period of time? Well, in my day, it was pretty simple. You had what was called a life mask. And you had plaster of Paris put on your head, front and back. And then they poured in a, an India rubber solution that formed the whole contour of your head. And then once that had solidified, they gave that over to the designers or the... Um, design department, and they would come up with whatever creature they wanted to build on top. But the mask ended about here. So for me, it was, it was lucky I could take it off when yeah. I was not working on set. Yeah. Uh, but today, of course, it would be entirely different, and Tim will tell you about today, and that you'd be in makeup for a, a great deal of time, and a lot of time at the end of the day to get it all off. Uh, but most people do say, wasn't it hot inside all these costumes. These guys um, will tell you yes, <laughs> but we weren't too bad. <laughs> uh, I was very lucky. I mean, Chewbacca and uh, C-3PO and all the other guys who were stuck inside, particularly Kenny Baker, who was in little R2-D2, uh, were particularly hot. For me, we had a props table at Elstree Studios, which was the length of this stage with two dozen heads of different creatures on the props table. And so, being pretty inquisitive, we always tried everybody else's head on. Not for long. It wasn't because they were hot, it was because they stank to high heaven inside the mask. So you didn't try them on for very long. But today, it's a lot different. 
Yeah, I think the biggest change is that we now have cordless power tools. They, they have a little thing, the Makita leaf blower, a little cordless leaf blower. And in between takes, they can just run in and they shove it in your mouth and blow all the carbon monoxide that you've been breathing out, out of the costume and you get fresh air in. But the story I'd like to tell, it was actually from Rogue One. You've got Admiral Rodas, who he's sitting out there in his chair, and Paul is in complete blackness. They hadn't built any way for him to see out of his costume at all. So we filmed for five and a half hours, and he sat in complete blackness with his earphones in, being told where to look to find us and where to look to see the battle and where to look for all of that. But the two other calamari were myself and Aiden, and we're both the same age. We're about 60 at this time. And they decided that they were going to do our death scene, which unfortunately didn't make it into the movie. But we did it in a classic Star Trek fashion where they tilt the camera and we all went to the left and then they tilt the camera and we all go to the right. So we were having great fun doing this. But out of my nostril, which is all you can see out of in the calamari costume, I could see that Aiden was dying better than me. He, when the explosion came, he went right out of his chair and over the back and was landing on the floor and all that. And it's like, okay, you're not gonna do a better job than me. So I was throwing myself across Rodus's console, you know, and trying to do all this. But of course, at the age of 60, I ran out of air. <laughs> so I got up and I, I went to the AD and I said, I, I need my dresser. I need to just get the fan in. I need some fresh air in here. And this young 24-year-old gentleman said, go back and sit back down. We haven't finished filming yet. <laughs> I said, you don't understand. I'm dying in here. <laughs> and if there was one thing I wasn't going to do, it was to die for my art. So <laughs> That's cool. Thank you so much. Um, so I just wondered, like I always ask this, if people have been in iconic films like you guys have, did you get to keep anything from the Star Wars films? I know maybe you might not want to tell me, but... Did you get to keep anything as any souvenirs? Did they give you anything? Did you get to keep anything from the Star Wars films? Right. I'll, I'll tell you my, my story, uh, which I told yesterday. The only thing that I took home from my little scene uh, was, was my gun, because it was quite cool. The props department had altered some German Mausers. Those were all the guns we had on the very first film. They were real guns, but the props department had put little bits of plastic all over them to make them look like space guns. So this was quite cute, and I thought, yeah, I like this. So I took it home. In those days, you could have taken the entire set. Nobody was interested. Today, entirely different. So I took the gun that I'd, uh, I'd been given to use in my scene with Harrison, and gave it to one of my little kids. Said, here you are. He played with it for a couple of years, but then after about two years, he snapped off the front of the blaster. And I looked at it and thought, oh, that's broken. Threw it in the bin. Oh, no. Do you know how much that gun would be worth today? A Star Wars film at prop, least wow. Half a million dollars, oh I'm told, God. in the States. So I threw my kids' education in the <laughs> bin. But that's the only thing I remember taking. Oh, that's a great story. That would have killed me. Wow. You, you did have things that you were given on set in those days. I, the film was actually, while we were making it, it wasn't called Return of the Jedi. It was called Blue Harvest Horror Beyond Imagination. And we all got our Blue Harvest t-shirts and our Blue Harvest baseball caps and everything. And when filming stopped, I went back home and I was redecorating, so I put on my t-shirt and my baseball cap to keep the paint off me. And when they got covered in paint, I threw them away. Well, of course, those go for <laughs> seven or eight hundred dollars now or whatever, you know, for that. And I had a, um, a Revenge of the Jedi, because after Blue Harvest, it then became the Revenge of the Jedi. And I had my Revenge of the Jedi t-shirt. And there was a young American child who somehow had gotten hold of the full crew list. And he was calling up everybody on the telephone, transatlantic, to talk to anybody who'd worked on the movie. 
And I was talking to work with one of my friends, and he said, oh, yeah, I was talking to that kid, and his dad came in the room, and you could hear his dad go, are you on that telephone again? Do you realize you cost me $250 last month in telephone calls? To you know, so there was all this sort of thing. And he had sent me a letter saying how much he liked the performance and everything. So I thought, well, I'm doing nothing with this Revenge of the Jedi t-shirt. So I sent him the t-shirt. And he sent me a letter back thanking me, saying, oh, thank you so much. These go for $750 over here. Uh, could you send that back to me, please? I may, <laughs> I may have made a mistake here. I, <laughs> I didn't realize that people were going to start collecting any of this stuff. So. <laughs> Slight error. Didn't realize how much merchandise obviously came out of the Star Wars franchise. Have, have you ever seen any very co any cool stuff that people have brought for you to sign? Because I've seen like so many cool paintings. We've got some amazing artists in here, by the way, which are in the Traders Hall. Um, but do, have, has anyone brought anything cool where you thought, that is awesome, have you drawn that? Or have you got well, any experiences? I, I grew up playing with Lego. Lego. <laughs> so when the, well, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if he knows this. At home, <laughs> I have my little Lego stand and it has Akbar, Guido, and Boba Fett on it. Because <laughs> oh, those amazing. are my three sort of Star Wars characters. But when they'd made my character in Lego, I like, this is immortality because long after I'm in the ground, kids are still going to be playing with this guy. Yeah. <laughs> so that was special for That's me. Cool. That yeah, That's cool. Yeah, I too story. have got the same Lego little characters at home, and they're, they're my favorite things. Cool, of all the they? Star Wars stuff. The, the story of merchandise is, is quite interesting. It, it, George, you might know, bought the whole of the merchandising rights for the whole of Star Wars. No. From a man in LA 40 odd years ago. I don't wow. know the exact figure, but it was around about $80,000. And it's rumored that that man is now shoring up the concrete pillar of the LA highway. <laughs> <laughs> because it was such an incredible good move. deal. And a good move, as you wow. say. I mean, so he's a billionaire he for made the rest sure of his of that. life. That'll be a millionaire, billionaire for the rest of his life, no doubt. Wow. So I've just dragged Garth on stage. He's just behind us here. And he runs one of our amazing cosplay Star Wars groups, uh, Great Jedi Cosplay, who are doing free, uh, uh, well, are doing lightsaber sessions next door. But it's Garth's birthday today, so he doesn't know that we're going to sing happy birthday to him. So I'm sorry, Garth, you probably hate me now. This is a complete surprise. But obviously, we, I can't sing. I'll start us. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear God. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Hooray! Garth, I know you must absolutely hate me right now, and you're going to hate me for all the conventions we do. Well, I hope that was an enjoyable experience. We've got some legends from the Star Wars film, so I ho thank you so much for being part of it. Yay. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> um, so I'm going to ask some Q We're going to do questions in the audience now. Um, so if anyone's got any Star Wars burning questions uh, for Tim and Paul, put your hand up. And the lovely Crystal. Say hello to Crystal. Don't be shy, this is your only chance. This is the only chance you're gonna get. So put your hand up if you'd like to ask some Star Wars questions. This lady at the front. Mm. Gentleman down there. Lady down there, yeah. It's also Han Solo's birthday as well. Han Solo's yeah, birthday today? Yeah, it, Connor's birthday as well. It is oh, happy, happy, oh, birthday. Okay, happy, birthday. happy birthday. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, to you. Happy birthday Han Solo. I didn't know that. Thank you for letting me know. That's the best question we've been asked in the entire time. Great question. Okay. Gentleman over there. The gentleman over here, Crystal. Thank you. I think. Uh, we've got one from Garth. We'll get you eventually. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Okay, hi, sir. Hi, um, this is a question for Akbar. 
Yes. It's a bit of a strange question. I'm going to ask it anyway. As a member of the calamari, when you ever go, if you go out to a restaurant and you fancy octopus, <laughs> do you ever feel a little bit cannibalistic? Oh, great Personally, question. Personally, I find octopus a bit rubbery, usually. <laughs> it's not an issue. You don't particularly like it anyway. That, that one's good for you. <laughs> yeah, uh, no, my I'm, I'm not a big fish eater, no. <laughs> oh, God, it has a my, my, too. Uh, and my other question is, um, could you please give us a line in Greedo's native tongue? Puta, puta, solo. Oh, yes, thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> I'm fluent. I'm fluent in Rodea. Any more questions? Put your hand up for us. This little boy, this little boy here. Thanks, Crystal. Have you played any of the Rodian characters in the Star Wars films, or just Greedo? I, unfortunately, only Greedo. I'm afraid they did ask me to do a little bit in um, in the Force Awakens, but it wasn't another Rodian. So I'm kind of happy to uh, to go out as the single Rodian assassin failed, basically. <laughs> but no, thank you for that. I wish I had, actually. There were other Rodians in the, the sequences I did. Um, there were a couple in the, uh, in the cantina bar, I think. Sort of, if you look very closely, you'll see some others. And in fact, because of the way we shot the movie, and because originally, uh, the, the first Jabba the Hutt was an actor called Declan Mulholland, and we filmed quite a lot of scenes with Declan, which George then decided to cut when he wanted Jabba to be the big uh, puppet that you see. When all that was cut and he put the, the movie together, you see me in that little scene with Han Solo, and then I die, and then you see me again in the next scene underneath the Millennium Falcon with Harrison. So I said to George, George, you do realize that's me after I've died in the next scene? And he said, uh, all Rodians look the same. And I say, do they wear the same clothes then? He said, oh yes, oh yes. So thank you for your question. I, I a have a side story to that one. I only found this out a few years ago. The, George was quite nervous, not just with Jabba, but with Akbar and these characters, that puppets could actually carry a scene big enough like that and do the part. And I found out that, in fact, every night after I finished work and went home, Dermot Crowley came in and did all of Akbar's lines, <laughs> and they double filmed it all in case I wasn't good enough. <laughs> because they were so nervous about having an animatronic character have a speaking part, you know, so. Thank you. That's a great question. Thank you so much. Um, any more Star Wars questions? I think we've exhausted them all. I think we've exhausted them, no problem. What about from the cosplayers? Have any, has anyone got any questions from you guys? No? Oh, oh, here he goes. One second. How long did it take you to put the uh, makeup on? How long did it take you to put costumes and makeup on. How long did it take you to put the costumes and makeup on? Thank you. Uh, how long did it take us to put the costumes and makeup on? Ten minutes? Yeah, it's a fairly quick costume to put on. I had the problem with, um, you get damp inside. <laughs> and it's foam latex, so before you put it on, you, you cover yourself with talcum powder and things. But getting the costume back off can sometimes take two or three people all tugging while you're holding an opposite object on the other side of the room. <laughs> Get it, getting the costume off can be a lot longer than getting it on. <laughs> Incidentally, the, uh, the jobs the cosplayers do is stunning, and most of their costumes are at least 10% better than anything we had on Star wow. Wars. All our bits and pieces used to fall off most of the time, wow. particularly the stormtroopers. They were all gaffer taped together most of the time. So they are pretty, uh, look pretty amazing. Oh, what a nice thing to say. Can I have a round of applause for all the Star Wars cosplayers, please? Wow, that's such a nice thing to say. 
Um, I'd like to thank you, Paul and Tim. Thank you for being part of our Star Wars panel. You guys are such a nice uh, bunch of people. It's been a pleasure working with you guys. And thank you so much. I want a big round of applause for Tim Rose thank and you Paul Blake. I want to raise See the room, later. please. And thank our amazing much. Star Wars cosplayers. Yeah. Thank you.